Um, good morning and welcome to this, the fourth meeting of 2015 of the European and External Relations Committee. I'm going to make the usual request that mobile phones are switched off, please. And moving swiftly on, we have a very full agenda this morning. Um, so we're moving on very swiftly to agenda item one, which is um, the continuation of our inquiry on connecting Scotland, how the Scottish Government and its agencies engage internationally. Um, delighted to welcome uh, four excellent witnesses uh, with us this morning. Um, who are going to give us evidence on how they do things in, in, in their um, um, countries and their governments. I'd like to welcome formally um, Rogier Albiana Aysadji, is that correct? Who is a Secretary for Foreign and European Affairs in the Government of Catalonia. Good morning. Um, Maria Angeles Elzora Zubiria, who is the General Secretary of, of Foreign Affairs. And Mikhail Anton Zaragiota, who is the... European Affairs Director of the Basque Government. And finally, Lucas Van Damme, who is a Deputy General Representative of the General Representation of the Government of Flanders in the UK. Good morning, uh, one and all. And I believe that you all have a brief opening statement. And um, for ease of purpose, we went by uh, alphabetical order <laughs> in order for you to speak. So, Roger, you're, you're first up. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Convener, uh, and honourable uh, members. Um, allow me uh, to express, first of all, uh, my personal and my government's gratitude for this invitation uh, addressed by this, uh, by this committee of the Scottish Parliament, uh, this beautiful and marvellous building built by, or designed at least, by a Catalan architect, Enric Miralles. Let me introduce to you also our uh, delegate representative to the United Kingdom and Ireland, uh, based in London, uh, Mr. Suarez. Well, honorable members, uh, regardless of the political process which Catalonia is going through at the moment, the Catalan executive, the Catalan government has developed foreign actions, foreign actions since the recovery of the democracy. Even before the statute of autonomy from 2006 was approved, uh, which consolidates the foreign and EU activity of Catalonia uh, in a text approved by the Spanish Parliament. For the government of Catalonia, our foreign action is an instrument uh, that should serve the needs of Catalonia as well as the interests of uh, its citizens. The Catalan international strategy places in the world. It is a policy that is capable of consolidating alliances and which sets Catalonia in direct contact with the European Union, with other governments and with other multilateral organizations, as well as civil society and Catalan citizens and communities abroad. The current political situation in Catalonia has led us to use our foreign action as a tool to raise awareness of the process going on in Catalonia. Our main goal is to help our allies, other countries and opinion makers uh, understand better that ours is a deep democratic process whose main goal is in the first place to let Catalan people vote and decide on their political future. However, this is not the only goal of our foreign action. I will now go through the main goals and tools. First of all, uh, internationalization of the Catalan economy. Strategy of economic diplomacy that includes the promotion of exports, tourism, and attraction of foreign investment as key elements to compensate the contraction suffered in Catalonia and with the overall objective of overcoming it and boosting our economy. Catalonia, uh, just for your record, uh, represents 16% of the Spanish population, similar to Switzerland. It represents or it accounts for 19% of the Spanish uh, GDP, similar to Denmark. Uh, Catalonia also represents nearly 28% of the Spanish exports and foreign trade. Uh, internationalization, therefore, represents 40% uh, of the Catalan GDP. And Catalonia received last year 17 uh, million of uh, foreign tourists. And um, according to the Financial Times, we were the first continental region attracting foreign direct investment in 2013 and 2014. 
One of the instruments we have at our disposal is an important network of external representation offices. For instance, seven government delegations around the world, Brussels, London, Paris, Berlin, Washington and New York, Washington for bilateral purposes and New York to follow the activity of the, of the UN and UN system, Rome uh, and Vienna, representing Catalonia's political business and cultural interest uh, abroad. The government, of course, uh, plans to enlarge uh, this network uh, in, the near, in the near future, in the, coming, uh, in the coming months. More than 60 sectoral offices, mostly devoted to trade issues, but also cultural and touristic issues. Uh, for instance, in Beijing, in Berlin, uh, in Bogota, in Buenos Aires, in Casablanca, in Copenhagen, in Dubai, in Cairo, in Hong Kong, in Istanbul, Johannesburg, London, Mexico City, Miami, Milan, Montreal, Moscow, Mumbai, New York, Paris, Prague, Santiago de Chile, Sao Paulo, Seoul, Sydney, Silicon Valley, Singapore, Stuttgart, Tokyo, etc., etc., etc. Second issue uh, I wanted to address, uh, bilateral and multilateral relations. One of the main priorities of Catalonia's foreign strategy is to create, maintain, and reinforce bilateral and multilateral alliances with other actors and organizations at the international level. For example, since 2013, our president, President Artur Mas, has held around 200 bilateral meetings with governmental, uh, governmental representations uh, and also multilateral uh, representations. Uh, we work on a scale of defining priority countries, uh, mainly EU member states, uh, but especially and in particular France, uh, Germany, the United Kingdom, uh, Italy, uh, as well as the other uh, EU states, uh, plus Israel, Morocco, China, Japan, Korea, uh, United States and Mexico. Of course, we have developed enhanced cooperation and bilateral collaboration uh, with some of these countries through what we call country plans that involve the embassies and the uh, consulate generals in Barcelona uh, of, all these, um, uh, of all these countries. Uh, in terms of priority regions, we mainly focus on the European Union and the Mediterranean region. Uh, the bilateral sectorial relations go beyond the commercial and trade interest and focus on sectors such as health, uh, research and development particularly, and development cooperation, for instance. In terms of the work we do with international organizations, well, the, our priority, we have also prioritized uh, international and multilateral <coughs> organizations, mainly uh, uh, the, the United Nations in the United Nations systems, system, uh, especially UNESCO, uh, the International Labour Organization and the World Health uh, Organization, which has an office, uh, a regional office in Barcelona, for instance. Uh, also, uh, uh, we tend to work with the Council of Europe, um, with the organization uh, for security and cooperation for Europe at the level of the parliamentary assembly uh, with the organization for economic cooperation and development uh, based in Paris uh, with the World Bank group uh, or for instance the Union for the Mediterranean uh, which has uh, its secretariat uh, in Barcelona. Uh, the Catalan government has underlined this commitment of working with multilateral organizations by setting up a new uh, directorate general within the Secretariat of Foreign Affairs um, to deal with multilateral and European affairs. Third area I wanted to uh, address, uh, the European Union. Catalonia has a strong pro-European vocation and orientation so is Scotland, as we, as we know. Uh, Catalonia has had a governmental presence uh, in Brussels since 1986. Uh, we were, and correct me if I'm uh, mistaken, but I think we were the first ones to have an office uh, uh, of all the uh, Spanish uh, autonomous communities in Brussels. Uh, we count at the moment with a permanent representative uh, to the European Union in the Catalan government's delegation to the EU. And of course, uh, through there, um, we defend our interests. Uh, for instance, uh, at the moment, we focus very much on the uh, European Strategic Investment Plan, the Juncker, the Juncker Plan, uh, on the negotiations of the TTIP, um, on the multi-annual financial program. Uh, we try to participate in the decision 
decision-making processes, but as you know, uh, sub-state uh, governments uh, do not have a clear uh, and a de decisive uh, decision-making role uh, in Brussels, uh, and we are trying to manage and ensure that European funds are available to Catalan companies and, uh, and Catalan people uh, at large. Fourth um, element I would like to, uh, uh, to talk about, uh, the law of external action and EU relations. Um, uh, this is, we believe, it's a pioneer law. Uh, we don't know of many sub-state governments that count with a law as complete as this one. Uh, it was very recently, a couple of months ago, uh, approved uh, by a wide majority in the Catalan Parliament, 100 votes out of uh, 135, uh, so mainly only, I think, the People's Party and a smaller party voted, voted against, but we really managed to grasp, grasp uh, a broad consensus. It creates uh, a set of new tools to promote, coordinate, and give more coherence uh, to the foreign action uh, of the government as a whole, uh, and not only of the government internally, but of the government vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the parliament, vis-a-vis -vis the other public institutions and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, uh, the local authorities and local uh, governments. Uh, some of the uh, new elements set by this law are the development of uh, the strategic plan of external, actions, uh, external action and relations with the EU, uh, which is a plan, it's a four years uh, plan, uh, which presents the priorities organized uh, sectorially, geographically and institutionally. Uh, this plan establishes four strategic objectives uh, for the next uh, four years. First, promoting and defending Catalonia in Europe and the world by the internationalization of the economy, culture, and knowledge. Example of that are the agreements signed on uh, research and development and innovation issues uh, with uh, Israel, uh, with Massachusetts, uh, the one that the president uh, of our government is going to sign in the coming months uh, in California, uh, among others. Um, second objective, confirming our commitment with the European and Mediterranean projects and uh, defending Catalonia's interests in the EU and in other uh, European institutions. Third, uh, contributing to the global objectives of peace, security, human rights, uh, sustainable development, uh, and social cohesion. Uh, the example of that, of course, is in relation with the participation in processes such as the COP21 uh, summit uh, in Paris, uh, or all the discussion on uh, the um, uh, obtaining or uh, the or envisioning uh, the, um, uh, the ODS, uh, the Objectives of Sustainable Development, uh, that will be decided in New York in September uh, this year. And fourth, uh, practicing a modern and effective diplomacy by supporting and giving service and assistance to Catalans abroad and giving a greater role uh, to the civil society. Uh, apart from that, uh, which, which are the four strategic objectives uh, envisaged in this uh, strategic plan, uh, the development of other instruments to help coordinate and give coherence to the Catalan foreign policy, such as the uh, inter, inter cross department, uh, sorry, I'm, I have the acronyms in, in Catalan, the cross department uh, committee of external action and relations with the EU, uh, or the council of uh, external action and relations with the EU, which is a council that gathers the president with a number of uh, actors and uh, stakeholders from the civil society. Um, uh, so from outside uh, the public institutions. Uh, I'm going to finish uh, just by um, uh, uh, underlining two additional points. Uh, one is um, public diplomacy. Um, we have, especially uh, during the last three years, we have developed a, let's say, a strong public diplomacy strategy. Um, we created uh, three years ago uh, the Council of Public Diplomacy of Catalonia, uh, which is a private public uh, institution, 
um, that count on uh, representatives from the political, social, economic, and academic, uh, academic arena to influence the external perception uh, of Catalonia uh, through um, the organization of uh, visits of parliamentarians, of uh, people related to culture, uh, to professors, uh, etc., and by bounding relations um, uh, with all these uh, with all these sectors, and basically um, to promote Catalonia as a trusting and uh, a leading economy of southern Europe with its own and differentiated language and culture. And finally, next to uh, this public diplomacy strategy, we have also been working on an internal communication strategy, uh, which is at the moment uh, quite important, and it aims at establishing permanent and fluid contacts uh, with media from around the world, particularly uh, in, um, in Europe, not only those correspondents located uh, in Madrid, but also in their own, uh, in their own country. Uh, and this is, of course, to ensure a continuous and close dialogue uh, with international opinion leaders. Um, well, that's um, pretty much all. I thank you once more for the opportunity of addressing to this uh, committee and uh, hope um, uh, we're going to have a fruitful, uh, fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, Madam Maria Elosa. Covina, members of the Parliament, uh, colleagues from Catalonia and Flanders, good morning to all of you. It is a really, good, a really great pleasure to be here today to appear before this commission. And uh, I will try very, very briefly to give you the key elements, uh, uh, the key elements of the uh, Basque Country Strategic Framework for Internationalization, a plan that we approved in uh, April last, last year. Traditionally, the Basque society has had high-level contacts abroad both at the institutional level, but also through its uh, stakeholders. In recent times, and once democracy was restored, the Basque government reinstated this tradition. In 1988, we set up a representative office in Brussels, and this opening led le lead the Spanish government to appeal to the Constitutional Court, alleging that its competence in foreign relations had had been breached. The Constitutional Court ruled in favour of the Basque government and the sentence marked a milestone. It clarified that autonomous communities, and therefore the Basque country, have the right, have political autonomy to develop international relations within the sphere of our competencies. Nowadays, internationalisation is more than ever in our agenda we consider it to be a strategic goal, a strategic challenge for the whole country. And the reasons for, the, for this are, quite, are very, very obvious. On the one hand, we live in a globalized context. We are part of the European Union, and our society is facing problems that are common to other societies, are in the end global commons, problems that require global responses. Along with these three elements, there's a fourth one, and this fourth element is the will of our society to participate, to be an actor in designing the global society. We don't want to be mere spectators. So in short, our future is on global stage. We cannot turn a blind eye to this reality. Internationalization is a tool to reactivate economy and to create jobs and to achieve sustainable human development. But how can this be done? In our opinion, it's starting with a global strategy, a roadmap that involves the, all the ministries of, of, of the Basque government and also wishes to involve the whole society. Thus, we have constructed this strategic framework after an intense participatory process. Our goal has been to achieve a common vision based on the experiences and contributions of a, of a broad number of actors representing a very large range of sectors. Our vision for the future would be to become a global actor, 
position ourselves abroad, participate directly in the European Union, and intensify our international presence. To achieve it, we have also defined four strategic objectives. Their function is to give coherence to the set of activities carried out by the Basque government, but also by Basque actors abroad. The first of these objectives is to showcase the Basque country internationally. If we want to attract investors, to attract tourists or talented people, we need to attain an appropriate international positioning. To reach this positioning, we are committed to a key tool, the Basque country brand, the vehicle to communicate our strengths and what makes us distinctive and interesting, our own language and culture, our shared values, a proven track record in self-government or a very large industrial specialization. We want the Basque country brand to be a competitive advantage. We are also committed to bringing to the Basque country events with an international nature. And also we are driving to, to, uh, for Basque agents to participate in events being organized in third countries. The second objective is to promote our multilateral interest and contribute to the global challenges. We are talking about encouraging the insertion of, global socio of Basque socioeconomic actors in global value chains and networks. Thus, our external action is going to be focused on detecting opportunities and opening doors, on setting up alliances with strategic partners to better promote common interest in the international arena. In addition, we aim, to, we aim to reinforce our ties with international organizations. We plan to enter new partnership agreements with some of them. We already have partnership agreements with OEA, Organization of American States, with UNESCO, with a United Nations Development Programme, and, and with the Secretariat for Latin America. We want to foster the insertion of Basque stakeholders in thematic networks and exchange view, exchange knowledge. Furthermore, this strategic objective includes also a key element to us, is our responsibility for and th with third parties. If we really want to become an, a global player, we have to make our contribution to solve global problems. Channeling the commitment of Basque society to the fight against poverty conditions in which millions of people live in this planet. Third objective, the European framework. We want to have a say in the European projects. Our aim is for the Basque country to have its own space in the European Union by means of an active participation in European fora in which discussions that affect our self-government are made, for example, in the ECOFIN. Nowadays, we participate in the working groups of the ECOFIN, but we cannot participate in the uh, meeting of ministers. And we, are, we have our own treasury and fiscal system, so we are fully competent in this question. We are working to increase the participation of Basque stakeholders in European programmes and projects, and we are also promoting, promoting inter-regional and cross-border cooperation, especially with Aquitain. Fourth objective, and the last one, is knowledge acquisition. The capacity to innovate and to manage new knowledge is key for our future social well-being and economic competitiveness. We therefore have to look for new inputs in all fields of activity. Nowadays, continuous improvement is required and capturing knowledge becomes a key uh, ingredient. We are going to consolidate relations with countries and regions that are innovative models in different areas. This proximity will, en will enable us to discover the best practices and to adapt and improve our own public policies. This strategic framework I was uh, describing uh, a minute ago wants to mark a turning point. In this new stage, internationalization become, becomes a new uh, cross-cutting aspect. Therefore, the whole Basque government is committed to it. To give you some examples, 
The Public Administration and Justice Department is extending cooperation with international organizations regarding transparency and efficiency in public management. We are obviously promoting the access of our SMEs to foreign markets, but also support will be given to the international presence of Basque artists and culture. In the European framework, we will search for the best practices in social policy, and in the meantime, we will try our uh, people, our company to part companies to participate in the Horizon 2020 programme. In the health arena, we are committed to exchanging knowledge on health system, single uh, medical history, or e-prescription models. Just those are just examples of the kind of things we are working on. The strategy also includes some geographical priorities. We have identified the territories in which the majority of the Basque uh, interests are focused. I'm not going to mention all of them because time is short, but at least speak, uh, speaking about Europe, lo, uh, the European Union countries stand out in our strategy for very obvious reasons. More precisely, the Scandinavian countries, as they are home to systems with high, with, with high social welfare standards, Germany, France, and the United Kingdom, because they are our main commercial partners. But also, we would like to continue working with other regions, federated states, and nations. We have, we share agreements, we have agreements already with Aquitaine, with Bavaria. In a couple of months, we will sign one with Flanders. And in the future, we would like also to cooperate with Scotland. The General Secretary for Foreign Affairs I'm responsible for is the authority enabled to coordinate and to foster the implementation of this strategic framework. And in this sense, we rely on our international network, a network that consists of six delegations, one in Brussels, one in New York, another one in Mexico DF, one in Bogota, one in Santiago de Chile, one in Buenos Aires. We have a representative office in Madrid and along with this, we have a network, commercial network covering more than 70 countries. That's what I wanted to, to express here today. Thank you for the opportunity of this uh, of appearing. And uh, la later on, if you have any question, I will be pleased to, to answer. Thank you <coughs> very much. And we move on to Flanders now. Lucas Van Damme. Indeed. Thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation and your interest in Flemish foreign policy. Um, what I will do is first give a general set of fl short uh, of uh, Flemish uh, foreign policy and then go over to uh, the summary of the management summary uh, of uh, our recent uh, policy note with five strategic objectives. Uh, and when having listened to our colleagues of Catalonia and Basque country, uh, there are quite some similarities there. Um, first of all, as you might be aware, Belgium is a peculiar country with specific constitutional arrangements. One of these uh, concerns foreign affairs. Uh, the main principle for us is uh, the principle in foro interno, in foro externo, uh, which, which means that sub-state entities in Belgium, like Flanders, um, are responsible for all external aspects of their internal competences. So, for instance, when we're talking about uh, the Bologna process on higher education, uh, it is Flanders and our uh, Francophone colleagues that will be signing the treaty and not our Belgian federal ministers. Um, so, Belgian sub-state entities have treaty-making powers, uh, although it will be in the frame of a general Belgian uh, foreign policy. Um, many bilateral uh, treaties uh, we're celebrating this year 20 years of cultural treaty uh, with the Netherlands for obvious <coughs> reasons as we share Dutch language um, though there is a recent trend to go from formal treaties to memorandum of understanding uh, secondly a lot of multilateral treaties what is EU treaties UN conventions uh, when it comes when Flemish policies are concerned when our competences are concerned then it is the Flemish Parliament that has to approve the international treaty as well uh, before it can be ratified by Belgium. Secondly, uh, there are, uh, we are competent to set up own representation and offices abroad, again in the framework of the broader Belgian foreign policy. Um, that means that many of these representations are embedded in Belgian embassies uh, as well as uh, Flemish representations are actually have uh, diplomatic status. Um, 
short on uh, our network of offices abroad, we do not have one integrated network, rather three interdependent uh, networks uh, of offices, each reporting to their home office. Uh, first of all, we have 11 <coughs> general representations, where I work for, in, here in London, uh, for the UK, um, including two development cooperation offices in, in Malawi, where Scotland is active as well, and uh, in, in Mozambique. Then we have about 70, 70 uh, economic offices. Uh, they are reporting to a Flanders Investment and Trade Agency and about uh, 15 tourism offices uh, reporting to a Flanders Tourism Agency. Um, whenever possible, however, if all these services are in one city, uh, we combine them in one Flanders house, as is the case in The Hague, as is the case in Paris, as is the case in New York and in London as well. So uh, there's the expression, put your money where your mouth is. Um, I give you just some indications on, on our budget uh, to get, a, get an idea. Uh, the overall budget of the government of Flanders amounts to about uh, 40 billion euros. That's about 30 uh, billion pounds uh, for 2015. About half a percentage uh, is for the uh, foreign policy domain. So around 185 million, 136 million pounds that is. Um, though we have to realize that uh, a big chunk of it, 85 million, is for tourism purposes, both international promotion and leisure investments in Flanders itself. On the other side, which, which is excluded in this amount, uh, are investments, expenditures done by other departments. The Department for Education uh, gives contributions to UNESCO, for instance, or uh, there's deep involvement uh, of the Agriculture Department in the Common Agriculture Policy on, on European level. So, but to give you an idea, it's something around uh, 130 uh, million pounds uh, we're investing in it. Uh, the cost of our network abroad, uh, don't have the recent uh, figures on that, but in 2012 it was about uh, 23 million pounds. Uh, so biggest chunk go to our uh, broadest network of uh, economic offices. So that as a first uh, introduction to, to see where we are more or less, um, I would like to go to uh, the strategic objectives uh, which have been identified recently uh, since June this year. We have a new uh, government of Flanders. Uh, so in autumn they drafted a new policy paper on uh, foreign affairs for the next five years. Um, so the first of uh, these strategic objectives is obviously for any uh, foreign policy is uh, at, at its core is the duty uh, to defend our interests internationally. Uh, and what is quite specific, uh, may not surprise perhaps, is that the most important lever to that end is, is, is identified as the European Union. Flanders is a strong, wants a strong and performing EU, um, and that takes into account Flemish interests. Um, so um, there, are di there is direct involvement of Flemish administration, Flemish ministers around uh, the table uh, in European uh, ministerial meetings when our policies are at stake and concerned. We, as Belgian uh, regions and communities, we make Belgian positions within uh, the EU. Um, when reading the Smith Commission proposal, there is something hinting towards that uh, for Scotland, uh, so I hope it could be further developed uh, for you as well. Um, so EU, very important. As well, obviously, bilateral relations with countries and partners uh, inside and outside the, the EU, though there is uh, a priority on the neighbouring countries. And thanks to the Euro Tunnel, we consider the UK as a, as a neighbouring country as well, with direct trains now. Um, so uh, it's not only the UK, also Germany, France, the Netherlands are the main uh, partners. Uh, next to that, we want to continue our involvement in international uh, organizations, which also the Spanish colleagues have, have been mentioning, OECD, uh, UNESCO, etc. Second objective is uh, enhancing Flanders' reputation abroad, something that's also uh, playing an important role uh, for public diplomacy or uh, uh, what Bus Country was, was uh, mentioning earlier on uh, as well for showcasing uh, oneself. Uh, so, importance of uh, international promotion of Flanders uh, to make our region more attractive to a series of, of target groups, whether it's students, researchers, cultural lovers, fashionistas, investors, uh, quite important, and, and tourists. Um, and linking as well with the expat communities. There are quite a few in Belgium, uh, notably in Brussels, so that's also something that we take at heart. 
um, a special eye for international guests visitors program uh, that's also um, within this uh, goal. Then the third one concerns the internationalization of Flemish economy. Again, something uh, Catalans uh, have mentioned before uh, for Catalonia as well. So that's, that's vastly important that uh, Flemish companies realize that the, the key to sustainable growth, both for their businesses as well as for the Flemish economy as a whole, is going global, really. Um, so we want to support that uh, by strengthening our network of economic posts abroad, as well as one coordinated st strategy. So both with public authorities and civil society and companies together, we will develop a multi-annual strategy on, on that. Um, obviously, there is uh, attention uh, for more free trade worldwide, as well as fair trade. Uh, that brings me to the next, the fourth um, objective, and that's contributing to the initial fight uh, against poverty. So Flanders is not obliged to do any, give any development aid, but we feel as an affluent region uh, that we are, uh, have, a, have a moral responsibility to contribute uh, to that. So we will be looking forward to the new post-2015 UN Global Framework for Sustainable Development uh, and Poverty Reduction. Specifically for Flanders, uh, we will be looking at focusing, limiting our investments, our contributions to one sector per partner country. So I mentioned already Malawi and Mozambique, as well as South Africa, we have been working uh, with in the <coughs> past. That's under review. We're going to consider uh, South Africa will remain an important bilateral partner, but perhaps not in the framework of, of development uh, cooperation. Um, fourth. No, fifth, right now, I'm, I'm going fast, um, is the commitment to a more democratic and just society worldwide. Uh, Flemish government always has promoted human rights, good governments, democracy, sustainable uh, and responsible entrepreneurship. For instance, in trade agreements, we always insist on, on social standards, on environmental standards. That is quite important to us. Um, in addition to that, um, France is also responsible for the licensing policy for international trade in uh, strategic goods and weapons. So we wanted to do that responsibly, um, also with an eye on <laughs> well, it's a bit word, world peace in the end. I mean, it's, uh, it's quite important uh, to do that in a careful way. And last but not least, it's peace promotion. Uh, there have been going on quite a lot of World War I commemorations. We think it's very important, but our angle to it is also peace promotion to go with that. So I'll keep it with that. If there are more questions or more practicalities on how you do things here in the UK and in Scotland, I'd be very happy to uh, come back to that later on. Thank you very much. I believe there's many, many areas in all of your contributions that, that we would like to explore. And um, I'm going to op open to my colleagues for questions first. And just uh, to maintain a free flow of communication, remember that us Scots sometimes talk too quick for other people. If I could just <laughs> remind members to be a bit more uh, uh, mindful of, of how and, and how quickly we say things. Um, so I'm going to go, first of all, of all to Jamie McGregor. Thank you. I was going to ask questions about the the offices, um, and I'm, not, I'm always accused of speaking too slowly. So, um, and also, I'm very aware of the, the, the historic significance of the, the, of the Basque peoples, um, especially their contribution to the fishing industry, which is quite possible, I believe, that they took advantage of the cod industry in, in, uh, in Newfoundland long before other European nations did. Um, but anyway, my question today is about uh, the geographic range of uh, sub-state governments' overseas offices and um, the number of offices and how they are funded. And, uh, for example, we had a, a, a Professor Michael Keating painted a picture where he said that um, with the view to the, the, the sub-state offices, every few years a new government closes most of them down because they're the first thing that go in a crisis. Uh, then another government comes in and opens them up again. Uh, is this your experience? And how do you... Uh, I know you're, you, that Catalonia wants to open another 53 overseas offices. Uh, how will these be funded, and, and especially in the present economic crisis? Uh, 
I can, if you want, I can start by explaining how, how do we do it in the Basque country. As I said before, we have six delegations which, are, which represent the Basque government in the countries they are located. So it's part of the government structure and they are funded by the government. It's in my uh, budget. I have an, an amount for every, uh, every and each of those delegations. So it's directly funded by the government. It's true that in the past, in the past, none of our delegation has been closed, even though they mentioned at a certain moment the Socialist Party announced the closing, but they didn't do it. The question is that in some of those offices, at the time, in some of those delegations, there was no delegate. And they decided that some of the delegations would have, rather than act in a country, they would act in the country they are located in, plus in some neighboring countries. We have a bit changed this, this uh, structure, but, uh, and we have delegates in all of them. It's important to have a delegate because it marks, gives the priorities and it pushes the, the, the presence of this delegation. We have a representative office in Madrid, which is to us very helpful, helpful with, in maintaining the contact, uh, especially with the diplomatic, uh, diplomatic bodies located in Madrid, with embassies. We, we have a very close relation with many, many of the embassies, foreign embassies located in, in Madrid. And apart from that, I was saying, we have the institutional network and a commercial network. How is it financed? The commercial network is not linked to the government, but to an agency which is public. So we have a, a development agency, which is called SPRI, depending on the Ministry of Economic Development, and is SPRI is the one financing this uh, network of offices. In some of the countries, the nature of the, of the <coughs> offices is different from country to country. In several countries, we have offices on our own, 100%, because uh, there is a real interest, uh, because we have many companies operating in these markets, so there is a lot to be done, and we, we need someone to work 100% of his time for us. In other countries, rather than having an office, we have freelancers. We select them, but we don't have critical mass to have people working just for us. So we start like this in, several, in many countries, but if we see that we start to receive many demands from companies, to be assisted, to be accompanied, then we move from this uh, scheme to an office. That is the situation, and nowadays we have 14 commercial offices. Part of those 14 are located in the within the delegations, because when there is a delegation, the delegation covers everything, and others are located, are located in places such as Beijing, Singapore, Mumbai, the Czech Republic, Polonia, Turkey, and I don't, I don't remember others now. More or less the markets we are selling in or we are investing in because our companies, since they are not producing final products but components, they have to follow their customers throughout the world. So they are investing and opening plants in many of those countries, and we have to support them. I don't know if I answered your question. That sounds very good. Um, I think uh, I'd just like to um, talk about the different sorts of office. Um, do you, how do you prioritise, uh, I mean, whether they're cultural or financial or, 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 or both um, in different areas? Yeah, I mentioned two types of offices, the institutional ones and, and the commercial, and the commercial being 100% of the time or not, depending on the, quantity, on the amount of uh, money. When do we move from one scheme to the other? To be honest, the commercial uh, network grew much more quickly than the institutional for obvious reasons, because in the last year, our companies have, has, have invested a lot abroad, a lot. And uh, so it grew up very quickly. 
it grew up very quickly also because it's less complicated to open a commercial uh, office of, an, of a development agency than opening an official delegation of our government that creates, a, is, is perceived differently. It's true that once you are in the country, it's not the same to have a delegation or to have commercial office. Being a delegation opens doors, and being a commercial office opens doors, but less or smaller doors. And uh, for the moment, we have the delegations I was mentioning before. If we could, if the budgetary situation was different, we would open more delegations because it's an important tool. It's the real tool we need for a real internationalization process. It's of people that work with our delegations. The delegations work for the government, but they are open for any to support international projects coming from any, any actor. Cultural uh, project, uh, economic project, three people willing to enter into, uh, into contact with the universities of a country, willing to have a, or to reach an agreement with. Uh, the, the areas are very, very, very wide. So nowadays we have what we have. This is the picture. In the future, we should open uh, delegations once the, when the budgetary uh, situation in, improves, gets, gets better. We should open delegations in Europe and some of those in Asia too, to complete the picture. Thank you very much. Does any, any of the... Well, I, 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 I don't have much to add to what uh, my uh, BAS colleague uh, already said because it works uh, pretty, pretty <coughs> much similarly. Uh, in the case of, of Catalonia, we probably have more, uh, more, a little bit more of delegations and um, probably a bit more of offices. Uh, they are also financed uh, directly by our uh, government's budget. Uh, one of the things that the Flemish uh, colleague was referring to, I, I think it's particularly, uh, particularly important, um, and we have been requesting it to the Spanish uh, government in, in different occasions. Uh, which is the possibility of um, of being granted uh, diplomatic uh, status for our for our personnel uh, abroad? I mean that would simplify um, m many of the um, uh, well. Uh, <laughs> Many of the things or many of the tasks that uh, that these uh, delegations have to have to uh, have to carry out, but for um, uh, various reasons that I'm not going to mention, the Spanish government has always refused uh, uh, such uh, such possibility. Uh, going back to to the question you were you were asking about um, the amount of offices, um, well, uh, these 50 offices, uh, which are not 50, are a little bit less because we already have seven. Uh, we are talking here about uh, we are talking on institutional uh, and representation delegations um, that we envisage to uh, to create uh, in the in the coming future. This is part of a plan to expanding our our foreign service. So it's not that in the next two months uh, we are going to open uh, 30 uh, new delegations, but in the uh, mid-long term, uh, we have conducted a study uh, which would allow us to um, provide um, uh, accurate uh, service uh, to our companies, to our um, to our citizens abroad, and also to uh, to represent the government uh, for institutional reasons. Uh, if we were able to uh, to get established uh, in uh, in these 40, it's around 43 43 countries uh, across the world. If you compare that figure uh, with uh, countries of our relative size. Um, you will see that normally they have uh, they have even more uh, institutional embassies uh, outside because um, if you compare that figure with uh, the amount of uh, uh, embassies that countries such as Denmark uh, or Finland or even newborn countries or relatively newborn countries such as uh, Slovakia, the Slovak Republic have uh, outside, you will see that this, this increases um, uh, quite significantly. Uh, so it will be a step-by-step -step, uh, process that we, um, that we envisage basically to build upon 
um, uh, to build upon our our foreign uh, foreign service. Something that I also have to mention is that uh, with the approval of the law on foreign uh, on foreign action that I was uh, I was referring before, um, we are also now developing a decree uh, to regulate uh, the personnel uh, in in our delegations abroad because. One of the things uh, we have discovered is that given that this is not an immediate process, given that we opened an office in 86, we opened uh, more offices uh, in 2008, we are now opening more offices, is that uh, we, we have to harmonize the, the working conditions um, and the salaries. Uh, and given that all these offices are also expanding uh, their personnel, it's also important to uh, somehow harmonize uh, all these aspects, and this is uh, one of the things we are now um, mandated to do. My question, which wasn't really answered, was how do you finance them, government, especially, government. especially in, a, in, 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 a, in a financial crisis? By prioritizing, uh, basically, the, um, perhaps our delegate to, to the United Kingdom and Ireland could, uh, could better explain that, but um, uh, we normally rent uh, buildings uh, or offices which are not expensive, uh, especially, particularly in, in London, um, the rental costs, uh, which is actually uh, surprising, but the rental costs are, are, are fairly low. Um, we, um, uh, we concentrate all the units and all the sectorial offices within the same building, uh, so, for instance, if you go to Paris, uh, you will notice that Spain has, uh, just to give an example, the Kingdom of Spain has seven different buildings uh, because uh, they have the official residence uh, of the ambassador, of the bilateral ambassador. They've got two more ambassadors, and these embassies are located in different buildings. This, in, in a way, multiplies uh, the cost, whereas we concentrate, uh, we restrict the amount of personnel and we are not talking about big offices in terms of personnel. We also use interns. Interns are a very uh, useful and profitable, profitable um, let's say, um, source of uh, human power. Um, and, and we try to save uh, as much as we can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Van Damme, have you got anything to add from the Flanders point of view? On yes, that? perhaps a um, few points. Um, a in the question was referral of the offices opening and closing. For what I know, for Flanders, there have been some, some offices closed, but that has been compensated by opening others. Uh, so the one in Washington has been closed, but one in New York has been opened. Uh, one in Japan has been closed, but one in, in Spain and in, in Poland has, has, has been opened. So it's a bit of a reprioritizing rather than, than, than a tidal wave of uh, coming and, and going. Um, Specifically on why opening a post in a certain city or not certain country, um, it's also good to add that our most important largest network of economic offices, uh, they report to Flanders Investment and Trade Agency, which, is, which has a governing board with not just uh, government representatives but also uh, private sector representatives in the governing board. And it is they, private sector industry, that is co-deciding where posts will be opened. Uh, according to their needs, actually. Uh, so that's really market-driven. Um, when it comes to cost-effectiveness, um, you can see there is quite a, a variety in, in sort of posts that are open. Um, you have uh, offices with just local staff, uh, one person, maybe two. Uh, others, which are more costly, with an expat Flemish representative abroad, a bit more costly. And as the one in, in, in the UK, we have a larger office. Uh, we have uh, an office in, in London with five people, but also one in Edinburgh. And what we do as well to, to strengthen our network is we cooperate with our Walloon and Brussels colleagues. So uh, they have a post in Birmingham. Uh, so uh, our Walloon colleagues can use our office in Edinburgh and, they, uh, and we can use theirs in, in, in Birmingham. So it's also a question of, of, of collaboration and when it comes to uh, cutting costs is also being in the same building together, uh, hiring premises at the Belgian Embassy, for instance, uh, which is more uh, cost effective. Thank you very much. Um, Adam Ingram. Thank you, uh, convener. Can I ask about uh, the constitutional powers that you have to act internationally? 
Um, can I ask how they've been developing over time? Have they been increasing or have they been very confined? If I may, perhaps on, yeah. on, on this one. Um, the, the curious thing, the general principle, is that for everything you're responsible at home, you're responsible for your external uh, relations. So uh, our powers increase as much as there is more devolution within Belgium. So we had a recent state reform with more powers on, on for instance, on, on, on welfare. So we will be taking care of more, more welfare programs. There will be, for instance, uh, 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 a mission uh, coming probably later on in, in September to Scotland to visit the Scottish NHS to see how things are, are, are dealt with in Scotland when it comes to retirement homes, etc. Uh, because it's a new, uh, new competence we have. Um, so, but not a big constitutional change on having more powers. That has been since the early 90s already, already the case. Yeah. Uh, in our case, as I mentioned before, I'll try to more or less describe, describe which is the situation. Um, according to the Constitution, it is the state the one that has uh, exclusive powers, exclusive competences regarding international relations, but, but according to the Constitutional Court, this interna international relations has to be understood in a restrictive way. So by international relations, exclusive to the state, we are talking about the power of entering into treaties, of opening diplomatic missions abroad, recognition of states, or creating obligations that, that bind this Spain as a state. That is the sense of this exclusive competence. On the other hand, the autonomous communities, we have, according to the different st statutes, eh, statutes, a number of competences, which in our case are very, very large. We are competent not only to act inside our autonomous community, but we are competent to exercise these competencies also abroad. This is what the Constitutional Court ruled in 1994 when the Spanish government applied the court after the opening of our office. That is, the, uh, that is the, the, it's, it's a complex system in which there are two powers, the state having co uh, exclusive competence in external relations, understood as you know, this, in this restrictive way, and we have the, the, the political uh, autonomy to act abroad within our competences. It's a system that requires uh, finding trade-offs and requires mu mutual uh, loyalty. So in our case, external relations is not the monopoly of the state, and that creates ongoing tensions eh, among the state that tries to control and limit and autonomous communities such as ours that demand our political autonomy be respected. The last chapter has been recently the Spanish government, as Roger has mentioned before, approved a new law, a law for the state external uh, action. We announced that we would apply the Constitutional Court because we understand that the law, again, there was a will to control and to limit our capacity to act internationally. And in the end, we have found an agreement with the government, an agreement on how should this law be interpreted. And the agreement comes back to this uh, ruling of the Constitutional Court. So we accept, all of us, we accept that ex external relations understood strictly is in the hands of the state, but not all activity done abroad is external relations. For the rest, we have the capacity, the political capacity to act. So, following on from that, um, you're basically saying you, you, you have the powers to act internationally to further the competencies devolve to you. But does that uh, extend to representation 
to key international decision-making bodies uh, rather than going through the state representatives on those bodies. It's not an easy answer because it depends. We are not member, members of international organizations. Hmm. It's the state, the one that is, is member of the UN or UNESCO or whatever. At the European level, for example, there is a funny situation, to be honest. For example, there was, a, again, an agreement reached in 2004 because there was a will from our side and we were asking to participate in the meetings, in the sectorial meetings of the Council of Ministers in Europe that discuss questions, matters that affect our self-governments. So an agreement was reached between the Spanish government and all the autonomous communities. And nowadays we can participate in four of the sectorial meetings. We participate in agriculture and fisheries, environment, employment, and I don't remember the word, youth, I think. Health. Health. The system is one uh, autonomous community com represents the rest of the autonomous communities which has, have the competence and participate in the meeting of ministers as member of the Spanish delegation. This system can, is, is, is a an important step, but for us is not enough because there are other matters, other questions in which we are competent, fully competent. So the ministers are discussing about questions that affect us and we are not present in this meeting. For example, is the ECOFIN, the Council of Ministers for Economy and Finance. The fiscality in the Basque Country tax regime is decided in the Basque Country by the Basque institution we have our own legal uh, tax system, which is different. That is an area you would like to see your uh, powers extended to, uh, yeah. uh, so that perhaps a minister in your government could play the re leading role in the Council of Ministers on particular particularly matters that have been devolved to the Basque country. Yeah. Recently, in December, we had the, our Minister of Culture attending one of the Council of the Ministers, together with the Spanish Minister. And uh, we had also our Minister for Employment participating when discussing matters about employment. But the tricky thing is that we've stopped at this point with just four sectorial meetings and it's a question of it's a pure question of will to open the door to the rest because it's the same logic the powers are in our hands and the discussion affect our self-government so we are asking the ministry to change this situation but lastly it's very difficult to to for bilateral fora to be called and to be because we have a bilateral forum a bilateral commission on European Affairs, a bilateral state, Basque Country Forum. We asked last year for this uh, forum to, to, be, uh, to be called. We even uh, proposed uh, an agenda. <laughs> we are still waiting. But we will keep demanding, demanding because I think we have the right to do it. And, and uh, apart from having the rights, we have a huge interest. These, those are very, very important matters. It sounds very familiar to us here in Scotland. <laughs> yes. Ed, would anyone else want to comment on, on these matters? Yes, yes I would like to. Um, so since the, the early 90s, we have an internal uh, coordination agreement in Belgium uh, with the federal state and uh, regions and communities um, for the EU specifically. Um, so when there are our competences, it will be Flemish civil servants that will be participating in EU Council working parties, whether it's fisheries, culture, youth, uh, sports, uh, uh, environment, uh, agriculture, etc. Um, and it will also be Flemish ministers in the EU councils without any federal ministers uh, going there when it's purely our competences. So for fisheries, lack of sea in Wallonia, 
it's a Flemish minister that goes each time um, when it goes to environment, there is a, a changing role. So it will be the Brussels minister one year, the next one Walloon minister, next year Flemish minister. But what these ministers will be uh, communicating, the Belgian point of view, will have been coordinated beforehand with everybody involved um, so that there is one person, one minister speaking, but for the whole of Belgium. Uh, so that's what been uh, laid out. Obviously, there is a bit of the, the quarrel, should we be more uh, implied in some other councils, like the ECOFIN Council, um, and we're currently in a, in a, in a process of, of reviewing the Belgian Cooperation Agreement just to adapt it to the recent state reform, so it could be a bit more enlarged in the field of, of transport, where the, the federal uh, government is still in the lead, uh, to see if that could be turned over. So that's, uh, and when it comes to other international organizations, it depends a bit of the nature of these international organizations. Uh, for instance, for UNESCO, as it is on uh, purely community matters, uh, culture, uh, science, uh, education, uh, mostly uh, it is the Flemish and the French-speaking community that are actually uh, doing the, the bulk of the work and, and, and ministers being able to, to participate in those meetings as well. Okay. Well, it sounds, it sounds a bit more collegiate than mm. elsewhere. Well, that sometimes depends on the political tension. There are some, <laughs> sometimes it's less collegial, uh, I guess. Okay, probably good. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, convener, and well. Come thank you very much for your presentations. Um, could I ask about um, the measurement of some of the good work, obviously, that, that's been happening here? Um, and can you give some examples in which way that you measure the effectiveness of the work that you do in international engagement and also the less tangible aspects um, such as the cultural diplomacy? Um, can you give me some examples in how you measure that? Anyone? I'll, I'll take the lead then. Uh, the, um, when it comes to more clear-cut things like economy, uh, tourism, these offices have, have clear targets. Uh, that many meetings, that, many, uh, that, that much turnover, that many visits, etc., etc. For the general representations, it's less clear-cut, obviously. Uh, we have a yearly program that has to be approved. We have to... Uh, um, make that happen, realize that, implement uh, every year program. But as it is highly political on, on some issues, you depend on a lot of different factors. Uh, it really depends on, 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 on how things go a lot more. It's, it's indeed less, uh, less concrete, less, less uh, uh, clear-cut than, than it is for, for economical things. So unfortunately, when it comes to culture, um, we, we try to do our, our, the utmost, uh, but obviously a lot also has to, uh, depends on, on how much funding there is available, and we do it in the means that, that, that are available, obviously. Well, yeah. oh, sorry, yes, you wanted to speak. Um, it, it's, it's, I think it's a very relevant, uh, very relevant question, because uh, um, in many, let's say, uh, established uh, countries or established states with their own uh, foreign services, normally this question is not being raised up. I mean, we all assume that a country has to count with a, a large network of uh, embassies and, and consulate generals uh, abroad. Uh, now some countries are starting to um, re review the amount of, uh, of representation offices they have, they have abroad because sometimes they have been expanded, uh, expanded too much. But I would tend to agree with, uh, with a Flemish colleague. I mean, um, uh, when it comes to issues related to trade and economic development and representation of interests of uh, businesses abroad, um, there, there are some clear measurements. Uh, besides, of course, the general statistics, um, every trade office uh, is normally charging a, a, a symbolic fee. Uh, for the services they are delivering to the company, so you can actually see uh, how their their activity is uh, is developing. Uh, when it comes to cultural uh, or tourism, uh, it's more difficult to uh, to measure that, especially uh, culture. I mean, tourism 
well, I, I, I said before that uh, that Catalonia is a world leading destination, and last year we we welcomed 17 uh, million foreign tourists, uh, mainly from from Europe, but also from uh, from Russia. Russia, of course, going down uh, due to the uh, present situation, but also from uh, Asia uh, and from and from the U.S. So, I mean, uh, all our 11 offices, uh, uh, sectorial offices on tourism, are of course reporting and are by their engagements and agreements with uh, tour operators, you can actually control the activity uh, uh, and that these offices is, is, actually, uh, is actually performing. But culture-wise, uh, uh, it's, more, it's more difficult. Uh, of course, you, you can measure the, the amount of impact uh, for instance, when the uh, Ramon Llull office in London, um, uh, working mainly in the in the territory of the United Kingdom, uh, well, you know exactly to how many festivals uh, uh, and how many Catalan artists and uh, and Catalan novelists uh, they are brought here. Uh, what kind of presence Catalonia has in in international fairs? Uh, book fairs, for instance, where we are uh, very much, uh, very much present. Um, and besides that, our strategic plan uh, comes with a permanent evaluation, so a year-to-year -year evaluation, which is uh, which is given to the to the parliament. So the parliament. Um, the government is accountable to the parliament and indeed in that part, specific part, uh, the parliament also exercises its function as, um, as controlling uh, the role, not only in terms of expenses or expenditure, but also in terms of uh, activities and uh, of course the, there is a, a, a long process of scrutiny of the activity uh, undergoing in, in all the sectors related to our uh, foreign service. Uh, to be honest, it's a complicated question because many times the things we do, not only in external relations but also in other public policies, don't create immediate results. On sometimes the connection even between what is done and the result is not always clear because there are many other factors intervening. But somehow to try to answer your question, uh, and as I said, in our commercial offices, we deal with enterprises in the delegations. Also, we deal with companies. We help them in go international. In those cases, it's very, very easy. We know the number of SMEs, the number of companies we are in touch with every year. Some of those co companies, man, many of them SMEs, come because they want, they are looking for a, a, a commercial representatives. Others, because they want to set up an office, a commercial office in the country, and they don't know how to do it. So we help them uh, with the procedures. We uh, give them advice till the office is open. We assist the companies when investing in a country, investing in industrial investment. All the contacts, all the links, all the relations we maintain with public authorities are help us to obtain the best conditions for our companies. This is one example, and this happens in many cases, in many countries. Uh, talking about the European Union, as I said, we are not a state. We are not a state. We are not sitting in the Council of the, as a state, of the Council of Ministers, but as a part of the Spanish delegation. And, but since we are, we spend more than 25 years, long time uh, uh, in Brussels working with the delegation, uh, I think we have created a, a link, a very nice link with many people in the Commission. We have the capacity to influence and to talk with many people. We try to approach them not only uh, looking for money for our projects, but we try to approach them to let them know what are we doing to propose a practical experience of a government that, uh, that touches the reality. Sometimes we go to share our successes, sometimes we go to share our problems, but we always try to propose something, and that gives us the possibility of having access to a lot of contacts, a lot of information. All these contacts, all this information is of great, great value when you try to, when a new regulation is prepared or with, when a new program is being defined, being there, 
knowing what happen, happens gives you an advantage that then helps our companies, our research centers, our cultural actors enter better or have a better access to the European programs, for example. Uh, other examples, we are in New York, we have an office in there, we are uh, invited to many of the UN events and side events, many times not invited as public, but invi invited as speakers to uh, share with others our expertise in many fields. For, ex for example, we are being invited to talk about transparency, that is uh, transparency of how how to make people participate in the definition of public policies. We are sharing with, the, with UN women our expertise in the field of uh, equality between women and men. We have a, an experience, a long experience, many things to do, but some, some small successes that we are sharing with them. And now we are regularly, regularly invited to participate in different fora. For example, we, are, we also have a close and very good ties with the United Nations Program for Development, where our agency, the Basque Cooperation, started 25 years ago, and still we maintain it nowadays, even though we are in a crisis, we maintain our, uh, our uh, cooperation. Last year, we launched calls for 48 million euros, and uh, then we have a very, uh, a very close tie with the UNDP program, and they organized last year in uh, Addis Abeba a conference, a state conference. States were invited to talk about the post-2015. Uh, and the only other state uh, agent that was invited was us. So this is the result also of many years of work of trying to approach uh, other agents and trying to uh, go not only with uh, asking for money, but um, bringing proposals. And to give you a last example, for example, in this case, we have in, in China, uh, something like seven, eight years ago, one of the, our main industrial groups, which is a cooperative group, Mondragon, uh, opened an industrial park in the Jiangsu province. It's a big park where many Basque companies have uh, located their uh, plants. We signed, the government at the time it was the Socialist uh, Party, signed, signed uh, an agreement, a general agreement with the Jansu province, which we consider is good. And we are trying to implement this agreement. And nowadays we are proposing, we are working with the University of Nanji, Nanjing, thanks to this fr general framework, in order to open a Confucio center in the Basque country. So these are examples, very specific examples, of the things we do and the outcome they may, be, they may bring. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Kavina. Okay, final question from Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. Convener, good morning to you. Uh, I'd like to ask a question to you about TTIP. Uh, Mr. Isagi, you mentioned it in your opening remarks. Um, could you tell me firstly what each of your government's policy is on whether TTIP should allow access to health services in your territory? And what will happen if the Belgian and the Spanish government agrees to access health services through TTIP? What would happen in your governments then? Well, first of all, unlike the case of, um, of uh, Flanders as well as other uh, other uh, sub-state uh, uh, um, sub-state governments, like uh, for instance in Canada, we do not have the possible, or even in Germany, because the Bundesrat uh, has to give green light uh, to international international treaties and trade uh, trade treaties. Uh, we don't have the power to block or to even to influence. I mean, we can influence uh, this kind of uh, of policy uh, uh, through lobbying. I mean, we can lobby uh, the European Commission last week. 
uh, Mariana and myself had a chance uh, to talk to uh, Commissioner Malmström uh, in the framework of her visit uh, uh, to the uh, plenary session of the Committee of, uh, of the Regions. And our president has a regular, regular um, uh, contact with, uh, before it was Karel de Hoogt, the Belgian commissioner, now it's uh, Cecilia Malmström. Um, but we don't have a, an official way uh, to influence this kind of policy. However, the position of our government uh, concerning TTIP, uh, which doesn't mean that it's the position uh, shared overall by all the political groups in the Catalan Parliament, uh, is rather prudent, uh, cautious, but positive, uh, in the sense that we acknowledge um, uh, the improvements uh, that this uh, that this kind of uh, framework agreements uh, basically because we are we are a pro free trade uh, uh, government uh, will bring to uh, to the European society and to the and to the u s society but at the same time we are also prudent uh, because of course we are carefully carefully uh, trying to monitor all the uh, negotiation rounds the eight negotiation rounds that have already uh, that have already passed and what kind of let's say, achievements these negotiation rounds are bringing. Uh, to us, it is not a matter of uh, downgrading uh, uh, the social and the environmental standards, because maybe in Europe, uh, and it's clear that in Europe we have uh, social and environmental standards higher position than, than in the United States. But basically, it is a matter of working uh, in those standards that are uh, that are similarly uh, positioned uh, in the same uh, in the same in the same degree, and of course advancing uh, into uh, into uh, free uh, liberalisation uh, when these standards are positioned in the same uh, at the same uh, at the same level. Uh, another matter of concern is transparency. We have been rather critical uh, on the level of transparency that this negotiation. I'm really only asking about health services. I know there's many wider issues about TTIP, but I have no specific answer. I, yeah. I don't have a specific answer on behalf of the government on the health uh, on the health sector. I well, if we could ask your other no, colleagues no. what their view is. What's your policy on access TTIP access to health services in your territory? Uh, in again, I'm not as specialised for 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 the transatlantic treaty, uh, specifically on on health services in general. Uh, the Flemish government is, is pro uh, the agreement, uh, as Flanders is a big trading region. Uh, about 80% of our Belgian exports are, are coming from Flanders, uh, so that's quite important to us. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier on, it is, has always been uh, important to, to Flanders and Belgium in general uh, that there is due respect for social services uh, as well, uh, protection of culture as well. Uh, but very specific on, on, on this agreement on health, I, I wouldn't be able to give you details, but the, the broad uh, indication is pro uh, the general agreement, but indeed uh, care and attention for, for social services and, and, and environmental uh, issues. What I'm going to say is more or less similar to what has been said till now. In general terms, we see that there is an opportunity, commercial opportunity, an opportunity for investment. But, but I think that during the negotiations, uh, we must be prudent in order not to, not to downgrade the standards, the European standards, as, as Roger has mentioned before. So, we will follow the, the, the negotiations. We don't have the right, we cannot, no, we are not empowered to, uh, to, we cannot oblige the state not to sign it. And the discussion will be run in the, in the parliament in Madrid. But we consider that we have to find the balance between the commercial interest, yes, but uh, always taking care of maintaining the, high, the highest standards of living we have in Europe, of, uh, standards of protection. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, very quickly, Rods. Yeah, thank Campbell. you, convener. <laughs> I will try and be brief. Um, just following on some, some of the themes that my colleague, Mr. Ingram, was uh, mentioning earlier on. What are the lessons from Scotland? Do we? Is it about constitutions? Is it about relationships? Should we be having a Belgian cooperation agreement? What are the lessons from Scotland that you, you would advise? Uh, in terms of engagement on the international stage? 
what I think is, is, is quite important is, uh, what is important to Scotland, I mean, humble me, uh, is his involvement in uh, an influencing EU policy making, as there are a lot of laws made in, in, in Brussels that have a direct impact on Scotland, uh, just to name fisheries, um, that's quite important. So I think it would be quite important to take the Smith Commission proposals and really go for good internal mechanisms, coordination mechanisms within the UK so that Scottish voice on Scottish matters uh, can, can, can be heard. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, discussions uh, going on, but I think that is, is quite important and, and would be helpful for, for, for Scotland, obviously. Um, I would be um, perhaps not prudent if I was um, trying to, to recommend or tell you how, how, you need to, how you need to act. What I can say is that the way how uh, the, the Spanish cooperation mechanisms function uh, with regards to the, um, uh, to the external action of, uh, of its autonomous communities is not, a good, uh, is not a good example. So I would actually recommend you to keep away. Uh, and I think that my colleague uh, uh, Marianne was, was very clear when pointing out the difficulties that we have uh, to be present uh, officially at the, at the EU at decision-making bodies or at the uh, level of uh, international and multilateral organizations. I think that you can find in Canada and in Belgium and even in Germany uh, much better examples of how this cooperation between uh, the sub-state uh, governments and the central governments or the federal governments actually function. Um, From our experience, I would say, I don't know if this is a couple of comments that come from what we see in the Basque country. And if this is of help for you, perfect. I would end up I had to talk about what Scotland should do. I don't think it's my, it's my task. I think it's, uh, it's yours. But from our uh, experience, I would say that it is very, very, very important to clarify, very clearly clarify, which is the role of each of the administration, which competences are in the hands of the state, which in the hands of the Basque country, or in your case, what does Westminster and what is for Scotland. And to have mechanism to mechanisms to guarantee that this is respected, that there is mutual loyalty a mutual collaboration. I think that is very, very, very important. When two levels have to coexist and find trade-offs and balances. And the second element uh, concerning once you have a number of uh, a set of competences that uh, allow you to act internationally, in my opinion, it's very important to have a strategy and to make people get people involved in the definition of this strategy in order your strategy to be as closest as possible from the interest of the different stakeholders of Scotland. I think that is very important because otherwise you can be doing your best, working and moving everywhere and not doing what people, what your stakeholders need. And I think that gives uh, gives to the external actions uh, an incredible legi uh, legitima <laughs> legitimacy. Okay, that will you. be my two comments. Okay. okay, that was a superb final question to, f to finish with. Oh, oh, um, and I'm sure we'll learn lots of lessons of, of how things have been done by many of the, 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 the regions and the states that, that we are speaking with. Can I thank you very much for your very open and frank exchanges with us this morning. They've been extremely helpful and I believe the committee will be looking forward to um, um, continuing some of those conversations when we meet over lunch. So um, I look forward to that too. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to go into a brief suspension for a quick five minutes. Five minutes and back in your seats please. Thank you.
Good morning and welcome back to the European and External Relations Committee. We are moving very quickly on to agenda item three, um, which is our Brussels Bulletin. I would ask members if we can just um, pass the Brussels Bulletin and move on. If there's any other issues that arise from it, can we maybe make the clerk and team aware and we can take that forward from there? Is that okay? Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. So, um, and make the Brussels Bulletin aware um, to the other committees that, that require it. Okay, thank you very much, which allows us to move on to one of our, our second substantive issue of this morning, which is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership inquiry that we're taking part in. Can I welcome to committee this morning Lord Livingston, who is the Minister of State for Trade and Investment, and Edward Barker, who is the head of the Transatlantic and International Unit in the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills at the UK Government. Welcome to committee, and I believe you're Lord Livingston of Parkheat, um, <laughs> which is a, is, a, is a erstwhile fellow Ouija, then <laughs> um, Parkheat is the way to say it, Parkhead. Absolutely. Course, thank you very much. Um, we are delighted to have you along this morning, but I brief, believe you've got a brief opening statement before we get into questions. Um, no, I, I, I'm, nope. I'm, I'm into, delighted to go straight to questions, conscious of time, so I'm delighted to... Questions. Uh, Thank you very much. I'm going to um, uh, go with the first question, as convener's um, privilege. Um, you'll, you'll understand, Lord Livingston, that there's been a lot of um, keen interest in um, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Um, the, the delegation we had this morning from um, some of the other states across Europe were saying that they've seen opportunities in it, but, and that seems to be the exact same um, feeling that, that we have here in Scotland, there, there could be opportunities there, but, um, and some of those buts are the things that we've been looking at. And, and the main one is around about public services, and especially, particularly in Scotland with a fully devolved health service, the impact on the health service. Now, I don't know if you managed to get um, a sight of the press release and the information that went out from Unite the Union yesterday um, on the legal advice that they have sought that, um, and I'm just going to read it right off it, that the NHS is included in the material scope of TTIP. Could you maybe um, give us some insight into your thoughts on that and maybe some reassurances? Um, I think we'll be looking for pretty strong uh, words from you this morning to reassure this committee and certainly um, the, the people who have contacted us on, on TTIP. OK, I, if I can take a step back on it, which is, first of all, what's the intention of all the parties? Because um, that seems to have been lost in this before I get on to legal aspects and what uh, our trade experts, uh, you know, who we got an opinion pretty late last night, uh, we were trying our best to get it earlier. Um, and uh, if, um, uh, if you listen to the uh, uh, European Commission, uh, you will hear them say very, very strongly uh, that public services are not included in TTIP. They do not intend for them to be, and in particular, they've made comments about the NHS. So you may well have seen, and if you haven't, I can absolutely give you the uh, letter from Commissioner Malmstrom to me from a few weeks ago, which I think she set out the position pretty clearly um, in terms of uh, the NHS being in it, uh, which is, uh, i.e., the NHS is expected to... Uh, that it will carry on as it, as it is before, and it's going to be up to individual uh, uh, commissioning authorities, Scottish Government... UK and is in appropriate places to what they do. So hopefully the committee has seen that letter. As I said, if not, we can provide it. Um, so, uh, and if you listen to the chief uh, uh, to the commission, the other members of the commission, they also make it very clear that NHS is not included. Commissioner Malmström, who's Swedish, but her predecessor, uh, who was uh, Belgian. His exact comment was, the NHS is exempt. The NHS has always been exempt. It is just used in your country for political purposes. Um, uh, now, maybe Swedes, Belgians, etc., all have some reason why they're trying to mislead uh, the UK. I don't think this. The UK government is very sure it is not included, and nor does it seek to have it included. In fact, public services more generally. OK, does the US government want... Seek that reservation, then? No, let, when, let, when you uh, go into the negotiations. Let me go the whole, yeah. whole thing, and yeah. I will go through what the reservation is. Because the reservation actually is about public services and about public health services more generally. So let me talk about the reservation. And, and to be clear, um, I, don't, I haven't met another country around Europe who wants their publicly funded health service included in TTIP. So you've got a situation, European Commission, the European governments, the UK government does not seek to have it in TTIP. 
What about the Americans? Well, the Americans, uh, the uh, chief uh, negotiator for the Americans, uh, Big Dan Mulaney, Dan Mulaney uh, made a statement, and we can give you the quote, in which he said, uh, there has been a lot of discussion about public services. The US government does not seek to include public services in its uh, trade agreements. It is happy to confirm that it is not seeking to include it within TTIP. So the Americans aren't looking for it. The British government isn't looking for it. The European Commission, the European governments aren't looking for it. So if we start from that position, and unless, and hopefully we can come to the conclusion that, that, uh, that they're not all lying, you might not trust the British government, you might not trust the Americans, but perhaps you might trust the Commission as well, but not everyone is, is making it up. So then the question is, have we adequate, if that is the intent, which it is, have, have we adequately covered the issue? And if I can just read the reservation from CETA, which is sort of the state of the art, the, the agreement with Canada, it says, um, the EU reserves the right to adopt or maintain any measure with regard to the provision of all health services which receive public funding or state support in any form. That is the reservation. There's actually about three or four others that add to it as well, but that's a pretty good start. So, there is a clear reservation regarding health services. Now, what there isn't is there isn't words about NHS. Now, the reason there isn't words about NHS is because we're dealing with 28 states, and they all have their publicly funded health services. And, you know, if we, A, if we start saying, well, we'll have the NHS, but we, we don't specifically mention the French or the German or whatever, it's dealing with all publicly funded health services. We also don't suddenly say, well, let's have a special one for the police. Well, the police is also covered in one talking about publicly funded services. So... It's pretty clear. I also, I mean, I, I did ask uh, our, t uh, our trade experts last night about this opinion. I mean, to put in context, I'm sure she's a, a very, very fine lawyer, but the lady concerned um, is not exactly leading counsel. Um, she is an associate, not a senior associate, not a principal, not a partner. She's an associate in her firm. Uh, and her expertise, I believe, is in um, public health in the EU. It's not a trade expertise. We basically don't agree with her analysis. Um, now, what I'm very happy to have done is if there's um, a view that something needs tightened up somewhere, you know, there's a lack of clarity and the issue of private and public ambulances being mentioned to us, which the UK has a special reservation for in, ad in addition to health service. Happy to have that conversation, but the conversation should very much start from the point of it is not the intention of any party to include publicly funded services, not just health services, but other publicly funded services. And, the, and, uh, and, the, and unless you believe either the, the Commission and the EU are liars or incompetent, because, you know, given that that's what they believe in their, and they try and put it in the agreements, and they've, they've been pretty good in negotiating trade agreements over the years, you know, we're in a pretty good place. Now, I, I dare say when you look at some of the clauses, you might say, can we tweak this, or, how, or what exactly is the position on, 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 on this, and is there a bit that falls through, which is fine to have as a conversation. But publicly funded health services are excluded. Okay. Right. Convener. Um, morning, Lord Livingston. Um, you've talked about uh, CETA providing a bit of state of the art. Um, it's my understanding, and I'm, I'm open to correction, that neither the House of Lords European Select Committee nor the House of Commons European Scrutiny Committee have undertaken any specific work in relation to CETA. Um, so, in terms of examination at a democratic level in this country, we haven't done very much on CETA. So, uh, it may be the state of the art, but. Uh, Perhaps you can illuminate on how much scrutiny has actually taken place in relation to CETA at the present time. Well, CETA was agreed at a political level um, uh, a number of months ago. We have, through the scrutiny committees, kept them regularly updated about what is involved in CETA and uh, the issues and otherwise. Uh, I know personally spent uh, quite a lot of time writing letters regarding uh, mode four immigration, as an example. Um, so they have been very much involved, and they will. It will be CETA will be a mixed agreement, and there will be an opportunity for that to be reviewed. But when I say it's a state of the art, the wording today represents what the EU starting point is on negotiations now. We could take the Korean agreement, which is passed and everything, but actually it represents where the EU is. There will be scrutiny uh, on it, but the, the final, final uh, agreement before the legal scrubbing and the translation, etc., was how many months ago? 
quite a long time. So, but, uh, but the, after the political agreement, they had a final agreement about four or five months ago. And that's the process scrutiny takes. Will take what 18 months, two years, but we have certainly been a lot of correspondence. But however, the wording represents what is the wording uh, that I would think that the Commission would look to start off with the US. Because it's trying to aim to do the same thing. Some way to go in terms of ratification of CETA. I can only trace one European plenary debate on CETA. So, in terms of proper examination of CETA, we aren't really there at that at the democratic level at the moment either. Well, no, because it's a matter of, of time on, on CETA. Yeah. The full text has been published, however, and it represents the latest, uh, the latest wording regarding this is how we are trying to protect Europe as well as do modern uh, trade agreements, particularly with other advanced countries, and that's what CETA represents. So uh, it could be that uh, there's a parliament somewhere in, the, in Europe, the 28 states, who rejects it, but the reason I quoted it is because that is what the Commission would use as their basis for, uh, uh, for trade agreements. And I was asked about what's the reservation. Now, I can't quote TTIP. It doesn't exist. But what I can do is quote what the state of the art is uh, and, what we, and the basis upon which, when the Commission tried to protect the, the public services across Europe, what wording they put in. That's what I can do, and I think that's perfectly reasonable. The point is that CETA has yet to be fully scrutinised and therefore, yeah, that might be a premature point. Um, well, I ought to premature, put... Sorry, it's not premature that that is the wording yeah, okay. of CETA. Okay. It, is, it is not pre premature, and that is the wording of CETA. That is the point. I'm not saying CETA has been adopted. I'm saying that is the state of the art in terms of the wording. Yeah. Can, I, can I move on to a second point in relation to that? I'm a lawyer by trade. I haven't studied the Unite opinion. Uh, I can see it's quite lengthy. Uh, obviously, I would pay respect to that and study that in due course. But... Uh, in my trade, as it were, there's quite often the parlance agreements are reached where one party says this isn't necessary, but they adopt a belt and braces approach to try and get agreement to suit parties all round. So why does the UK government not want to listen to deep concerns on the NHS and go for a belt and braces approach? I think having the phrase uh, that adopt or maintain any measure with regard to the provision of all health services which receive public or state funding in any form is pretty belt and braces. But we are in part of the EU. So referring to one, if you refer just the NHS, for instance, does that include if there's publicly funded health services that aren't within the NHS? Definition of the NHS when you've got effectively the Scottish Health Service. Do, so do we have separate wording for the Scottish Health Service, uh, uh, you know, for an English one, for a Welsh one? You know, publicly funded health service covers over a very long time a very wide gamut, I think it is a pretty belt and braces. I mean, I can go on to talk about uh, uh, additional uh, pr uh, private uh, exceptions regarding privately funded medical services, which are further reservations. The UK, I think, historically has had an out for, um, in addition for private ambulances, services, etc. I was just taking the first of the main reservations. That is very wide ranging and should cover us in terms of the public provision of health services. The point it's trying to do in that, even if you, for instance, choose to have a public sector, a private sector providing part of your health service, it's still publicly supported and still covered by that. So actually, it's actually wider than talking about NHS, but also it covers 28 nations. And I think it would be wrong for us to sit here and say, well, we have one nation, the words relating to a particular activity. Now, it this is very, very belt and braces. So, you know, publicly funded, I repeat the words again, any publicly funded or state support in any form. I think you've got belt, braces, tie, ropes, everything in there. Others come in on that point, thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Um, uh, given that during evidence from the Cabinet Secretary, um, John Swinney, and the European Commission, um, it was suggested that um, you know, there can be winners and losers uh, in any trade deal. Uh, I, I was just wanted to discuss with you, ask you, which sectors of the UK economy might potentially gain and which sectors might lose out? And, of course, that includes the Scottish economy as well. Uh, I mean, I think... Uh... <coughs> Uh, it's a case of imports and exports and how they do. I mean, you're absolutely right. Some of the gains in the UK economy, the car industry, uh, I think, will, will do well. Um, we think uh, food and drink 
um, uh, should do well because, I mean, there's many products we can't actually sell to the US just now or they've got tariffs. So you look at where there's, there's tariff. There's some cheese products, for instance, of 18% tariffs on them. Um, it will particularly aid small companies because the regulatory differences are particularly tough for them. Um, I think uh, in terms of the areas that might lose, and some of it is in the short term, uh, some of the electrical mach machinery market, where the, where, uh, where the US is particularly strong in. Um, if there was an energy chapter, um, uh, maybe on some parts of energy production, um, although given there's a worldwide price, I think that may be less so, given we import from other people, um, you know, we might well want to replace Qatari gas with American gas, or I think give us more uh, options. So um, in terms of... Uh, the, the gains and losses, that would be some of the sectors. Anything else, Edward, in terms of gains yeah, and losses of sectors? No, I would just add, in terms of beneficiaries, I think we would expect the pharmaceuticals sector to be another um, uh, significant beneficiary. And life sciences, generally. Yeah. Um, and I think when, when we talk about <coughs> losers, I mean, it is a relative position, so it's possible that um, you would st still see growth in sectors that we're describing as losers, but their relative share would diminish, is, is what the study suggests. Uh, thank you for that. Well, you mentioned... Uh, can, sorry, can I... Oh, I was just go, oh, sorry, Jamie, I was just going to ask, um, is this not a, a rosy glow uh, over trade agreements here that somehow or other um, increased competition will lead to increased jobs all round? So there's a market and we lose market share, that means we'll lose jobs in those areas, will it not? For every job we gain, perhaps, in textiles, as tariff barriers come down, then we might, we might lose a job in the food industry as cheap American imports uh, come in and displace our own products. In some sectors, there will be an initial shift quite very small in relationship to totality, but there will be some initial shift. The question is whether some of the sectors then change. I mean, I'll take the example of New Zealand. When the UK yeah. joined the EU, yeah. New, New Zealand farm sector was really devastated, yeah. and it's now, as a result, become the most efficient farm sector in the world, and it's growing tremendously well. So you will see that sort of shift. But I think, I think, and it's quite important, it goes to a general question of do you believe free trade between uh, particularly developed countries, but I believe more generally, um, en enhances overall prosperity? And to give you an idea, the last major trade deal we did was with Korea that's actually adopted, and UK exports have doubled. A chunk of that's oil, but that's good news for Scotland, uh, but has doubled uh, since that agreement, which has to be good for uh, uh, the economy. The UK now has a trade surplus uh, with, with South Korea of over £2 billion it didn't used to have. Mm -hmm. if, um, if you look, for instance, at uh, some of the research done on the Uruguay round, the WTO Uruguay round, we've seen um, price uh, reductions for families of about £500 a year. Now, uh, that, and that's produced by, uh, by which uh, did that study a number of years ago. So there's some, there's some real evidence that, that trade agreements can help. Um, and certainly I believe things like the single market and free trade agreements do assist. Um, I think the alternative of putting up protectionist barriers, we look from other things, doesn't work. But I think some industries will adapt. That have, some industries will do very well from the get-go. Some will have some losses and then will adapt, and some regretfully won't. But the net, there'll be a big net, you know, a decent-sized net gain to, uh, uh, to the economies across the UK. Sorry, the point I was trying to make is we, we, haven't, we, don't, we haven't got an agreement in front of us, so we, we can't actually assess whether it's going to be positive or negative in terms of the flow of jobs, for example. In the North America Free Trade uh, Agreement, the Americans believed that they were signing up to something that would increase jobs in their economy and actually... They exported jobs to places like Mexico. So there's nothing, we can't take anything for granted in terms of what the outcomes this agreement would lead to. Can we? Well, you can absolutely say we do not have the final agreement. I'd be happy to come back in, uh, in a couple of years' time or whatever when we might have a final agreement, but you asked me to come today, so uh, that was rather it. However, what you can say, um, 
I mean, taking NAFTA as an example, a lot of people have different views on NAFTA, but uh, the Mexican economy is a very different one from the US economy in terms of labour costs, for example. Um, and it did, might have led to some movement of jobs. But the US economy since NAFTA has powered ahead. I mean, unemployment rate of uh, a, a, about 5.6, 5.7% in the US, you know, one of the few that's equal, that's equal with the UK in terms of unemployment rates, created it's created millions and millions of jobs. Also, it's gotten its neighbour, now a much more prosperous neighbour, and in Canada as well. And certainly when I speak to um, people, for instance, from Canada and the US, they generally think it's been a very good thing. But when we look at other uh, trade agreements, things like the single market, I think there's a strong belief it's been a good thing. I think the more one does agreements between... You know, unless you do a bad agreement, and I accept if, if, the, if the EU does a really bad agreement where they waive all the tariffs with America and America doesn't waive any of its tariffs... A, that's not going to happen, but if it did, then you could have an asymmetrical outcome. But when you've got two sets of developed economies that are negotiating on equal terms, you will see benefits in, in both of them from, from increased trade. And in fact, you'll also see benefits for third-party countries because there'll be you know, growth in two of the biggest economies in the world. Sorry, Jim. That's all right. Yeah, if I can remember what it was. <laughs> um, yes, my other point was, you know, there have been concerns also expressed by farmers and others about food safety standards. Uh, and uh, uh, that was one thing I was wondering if you could comment on that. And the other point was, uh, and I apologise for being a bit local here, um, we have the, the, the TTIP agreement, I've been told, may impact on the EU protected food name scheme... Um, with a, uh, which might impact on products such as scotch lamb and Stornoway black pudding, uh, which happen to be very important in my um, region. And I just wondered again if you would contact, uh, perhaps if you'd talk perhaps about the EU protected food name scheme and the food safety standards. Perhaps. Food safety standards, the EU have been um, uh, very clear that standards will not be lowered. And, some, and then you get the, oh, well, it's always a race to the bottom. The single market wasn't a race to the bottom. In fact, many of the complaints about the single market has created so many rules. It's, uh, it created a high-level set of rules. So the EU, in terms of... Because the, the phrase that's often heard, oh, there'll be um, chlorine-washed chicken and, uh, and, uh, and hormone-fed beef. And the EU com trade commissioners have said repeatedly and consistently, and the Americans know it, uh, and that's a case where the Americans would like to export it, but they're not going to be able to. They've said it's not going to happen. Uh, uh, EU rules and EU feeds, food safety rules are EU food safety rules. We should remember, by the way, that the Americans have quite a lot of concerns about EU food safety. Um, uh, as you may know, for example, they won't allow haggis into their country because they believe it's not safe. Um, you know, I think we should... In fact, we well, even had problems with Canadians not allowing iron brew. I mean, the, 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 people have some strange views on some things. Um, uh, the, the Haggis fed. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently, the, the, the Canadians thought there were some unnatural ingredients in iron brew. That's a naturally occurring colour. Um, uh, so on, on that, the... Being clear, and I think, to be honest, in the agreement, there'll be a bit of a price to be paid for saying we are not going to lower our standards because the American farm lobby would want some of these things in, but the EU has said no, they won't. And I think there'll be a price at certain things the EU might want that they won't get in return. So I think there will be. Now, will there be more non hormone fed beef? Yeah, I think there probably will be. Um, and I know the Irish have concerns about just efficient producers, etc. But it won't, be a, it won't be a food safety standard thing. And then uh, the second part of your question was on... It was on the EU protected food name Oh, yes. Scheme. Well, at the present moment, um, we do have some protected names in the, in the US, like Scotch whisky, which is pretty important, obviously. Um, and there is a, a big push to have uh, more geographical indicators recognised in the US. Um, uh, that particularly is coming from... Um, uh, uh, places like uh, Italy for Parmesan cheese, where the Americans consider Parmesan to be, you know, like just general like cheddar, a little bit, you know, well, we could argue about cheddar as well, but a general name rather than a geographical location. And, uh, and uh, that's causing quite an argument. Pl things that refer to where they are from, I think, actually tend to have greater protection because actually they're sort of, you know, you're stating a, a thing, 
uh, you're stating, you know, it is Scotch beef. So someone else saying they're providing Scotch beef and it's not from Scotland, or uh, uh, you know, or or um, uh, you know, or saying, and I know it's come down, you know, Welsh cheddar or something. That I think gets greater protection. I might ask Edward to to, to add to that. So I don't think there's anything we're going to go back on. The question is how much help can we get, as we did in the Canadian agreement, quite a lot of movement in Canada on protecting geographical indicators. I suspect we will get less, we might get less than we got with Canada in the American agreement, but certainly there's a big push uh, um, uh, uh, among feta producers and parmesan producers, fortunately not among hamburgers, uh, or else that could get silly. Um, uh, uh, but the uh, um, but I, 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 it will be a push, but I don't see a situation where things are getting worse than they are today. Actually, it's about push about making it better. But, Edward? Uh, yes. I mean, I, just on your point about the more specific the, the indicator, the, the easier it is to argue that it's unique. So um, West Country Farmhouse Cheddar is the one I tend to think of because I rather like eating it um, compared with cheddar. Um, I, I think our first um, priority is uh, indeed to protect what we already have in terms of the um, spirits, um, Scotch whisky um, <laughs> protection. But uh, uh, um, in, indeed, um, but I think certainly um, I would hope that products like um, Scottish farmed salmon, Scotch lamb, uh, and Scotch beef would all be strong candidates, uh, certainly within what the EU is asking of the US. For the US, this is a, a difficult issue, but that, that's certainly what the EU is pursuing. Okay, thank you, convener, and welcome, um, Lord Livingston. Um, just a wee quick question. We, we've had difficulty in trying to find um, some clarity on this. Uh, it's really about the lack of awareness across the Scottish business community about the TTIP negotiations. Um, can I ask you, Lord Livingston, what work the UK government has undertaken to raise awareness of the TTIP amongst the business community, both here in Scotland and the UK? Um, of course, we, uh, one of the things that's interesting about the Normally, trade agreements trying to get any interest in this has been really difficult. Uh, this is remarkable. I don't. I never recall uh, the uh, uh, Korea agreement. But what we've done, uh, you know, getting any attention. But what we've uh, uh, done is work particularly with the. Um, uh, the main trade associations, the Federation of Small Businesses, Institute of Directors, uh, um, the uh, CBI, to help get through the members, and also with a number of the individual uh, trade things. We, we've had roadshows, including some of them in Scotland. Um, we've also uh, set up a you know, website with resource. Um, and one of the things that's very important um, uh, is when an agreement is done, and we did this in the Korea, and we will do it in Canada, is to go to the particular areas that have opportunities or impact and, and, and work with them as to how we can take advantage of it. And that's exactly what we did in Korea. So today we, we spent a lot of time with, uh, and I've spoken uh, at a number of business events, I've also spoken at a large number of uh, NGO events and, uh, and to NGOs, um, uh, but we, we spend a lot of time, if you speak to certainly FSB, IOD, CBI, they're very, very much involved. But everyone's team, you do a lot of work. Do you want to add? Yes, I mean, I, just a couple of things I'd add to that. Firstly, when, um, when the negotiation was first getting underway, we did a fairly broad consultation um, uh, into which we got a lot of online submissions that helped, helped us with our initial identification priorities for the UK. Um, we have regular stakeholder sessions with businesses, but also with NGOs, consumer groups, you know, the full range of interests. Um, I, I've been to Edinburgh a couple of times with the roadshow, uh, Lord Livingston mentioned, and I think Ken Clark spoke at one of their roadshow events in Glasgow, and we'll continue to, to do those over the coming, uh, coming months. Um, and we have just recently tried to improve our website to make it a bit more useful and a bit more accessible. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Yep, thank you. Lee Coffee. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Lord Livingston. Um, could I bring you back to the health issue, please, to have a, open up a further discussion on that, if that's possible with you. Um, you said at the end of your uh, initial comment that publicly funded health services are excluded. I think that's what you said. I wrote that down. Could you tell me where in the negotiating mandate that was agreed in June 2013 does it specifically exclude health services part of the TTIP negotiations? 
Well, I think from recollection there's a relation to uh, uh, public services, but what I was referring to was the, uh, the wording we used. The, um, the, I don't think there's a specific reference to, in the mandate, there's not a specific reference to many things, but I think there is a reference to uh, public services, protecting health and safety and uh, public policy. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I think, I, think um, I, I would focus on the text of the agreement because quite a, lot of, quite a lot of the framing of any agreement that the EU negotiates would start from a number of assumptions, including the one that public services are protected. It, which, by the way, reflects GATS. And one of the things that the EU starts with is the, uh, is the agreement on uh, services that already exist and that the EU believes has a strong exemption. And we've had GATS for 20-odd years. I mean, one of the somewhat strange thing with all of this is it's sort of like this. we've never had a trade agreement before, some of the discussions. We actually have had an agreement on services for many, many, many years. And that actually is where they started. Then they've updated it for, for CETA, and that will be included. And you know, rather than asking the mandate, you know, look at what, in writing and verbally, the EU are very, very clearly saying about the position. So I think they've made the position incredibly clear. And again, I repeat, is it that people don't believe what the commissioner is saying? Because the commissioner, you know, I, I refer you to the letter she wrote to me. I could refer you to the letter that uh, uh, Bernascio, wasn't it, the, um, uh, also wrote uh, in, and also wrote to, I think, John Healy. Uh, the, uh, certainly the UK Parliament's had a number of uh, uh, witness statements and, you know, all making the same point. So uh, I, I know speaking to the commissioner, because in fact, even on Monday, she was in the UK, in London, speaking at a number of events. And she was at the end of it saying, why are people keep on asking me the same question when I've been clear about it. So I think, I think the EU's really tried to be really, really clear about it. And I think where the original man mandate referred to it, what the mandate certainly didn't say is that health services are going to be, uh, publicly funded health services are going to be open to competition. That I'm sure it didn't say. Mm. Yeah, but to be absolutely clear, you said that public health services are excluded. I would expect to see that clearly within the mandate. Otherwise, what's the status of the mandate? And perhaps that might explain why. I mean, perhaps that might explain why there's confusion and concern across the United Kingdom and across Europe about this. The mandate bill will build on GATS. GATS already has it excluded. If it changes GATS, it would the other way. It would say it, but it builds on GATS already. I'm sorry, I do not accept that the reason there's confusion is because it's not in the original mandate. The EU has been really, really clear at, on repeatedly. The only reason there is confusion is because people are putting out confusion and choosing to disregard what the EU is saying. That is, I mean, that is the situation. Now, you can think, you can decide, as I said, there's only one, two explanations. Either the EU are lying different people in the EU, you've got Belgium's line, you've got Swedes line, you've got lots of people, except you probably won't believe the British government on the issue. Or you think that they're not lying, they mean it, but, they, but actually they, they, they aren't competent enough to put the right wording in the agreement. I can't see any other option, because I mean, as I said, I refer you, and if you don't have it, I've even got it here, the letter from uh, Malmström, which is, you know, as of, um, that was dated uh, end of January. Or I could give you the quote she said in her speech on Monday night. Yeah, it's been said time and time and time again. And I do, I do genuinely worry that people are using the NHS as some sort of political football here. I th and it's also missing, I think, having a really proper discussion about what you want included, what you don't, how do we make sure we tighten things up, what, what, um, uh, what has happened in the world in the last 20 years that might cause different things, because people are, are starting from the wrong position. And, uh, and I, think, I think that's quite dangerous because we'll, we'll, we'll miss things. Because I think there are genuine, and I'm happy to talk about them later, genuine issues that have to be debated within TTIP about wording, about intent, about position, about what's acceptable for Europe or else we don't do a deal. These things need to be debated. But please, I, I would ask you to start with the position that the EU is not lying. Well, I mean, I'm certainly not going to get into that. Territory, but can I refer well, you it's, to... it's only logical. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. It's the only logical explanation. You either think that they're that they're lying when they say it, or they're not able to put it in. I'm, I'm sorry, no, I think you have to. Sorry, <laughs> sorry Willie. I, I don't. I don't believe that's actually true, and I think it's actually a diversion for the real argument here. Yes, there is the reservation in CETA, which, from from my point of view, you know, states it quite clearly. Yes, you know. 
commissioners in the EU have stated very, very clearly you know, their intention. I think what we need to know is what is the UK government saying in all of this? Will they go to the negotiating table with the CETA agreement saying that's what we want and that's how we want to protect our public services? I think that's the main question here. I can, give that, answer, I can give that answer not. very clearly. The UK is very happy with CETA and, we, uh, and we'd want to see that uh, replicated. Will it be in your negotiating plan when you go to... To, to negotiate well, I, the I UK's sorry, position. I don't go to negotiate the UK's position. The EU negotiates the EU position. I sit in the Council meeting and I have talked to the Commissioner repeatedly about the NHS and ensuring that she is entirely on side about it, and she is. There is no issue with... That's why I asked for the letter. That Commissioner Malmstrom letter was in response to me requesting to be clear, to be 100% clear in her views. So it is very, very clear. And the UK government is happy with her letter. It makes it clear the position. We are fully supportive of that. Will the UK government now be in a position to answer the First Minister's letter when she seeks those reassurances? I have answered, the, the, I answered Alex Hammond's letter. I responded to Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, I got a letter from Alex Hammond. I responded to Nicola Sturgeon very clearly. I can be happy to give you a copy of the letter if you don't have it. I responded. Uh, it, was in the, it was written by Alex Hammond. I responded, and we made it clear that we have made this uh, 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 repeatedly. The fact they choose not to accept it is a different matter, but we have made it repeatedly. If you don't have that letter, I'm very happy to, to give it to you. Willie, do you want to finish your line of question? Yes, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah, uh, your colleague, um, a chap called Earl Howe in September, who's a UK health minister, he, I don't know whether he still is or, or not, said quite clearly that trade talks must not exclude access to healthcare. And he went on to say that exempting health would not be in the interest of British pharmaceutical firms. So, who's right, you or him? There's a big difference between health and publicly funded health no. services. Okay. Health, for instance, pharmaceutical and life sciences industry. Uh, Scotland has a very good and very high-tech life sciences industry. Do you want it to be able to have access to the US? That's the question. That's why health is different from publicly funded health services. Okay. So, so the pharmaceutical industry, for example, we do, have, you know, uh, making sure that that's included uh, in, uh, in in access to the U.S. markets, you know, so or the revolutionary treatment on hip joints or or touch bionics, for instance. I think maybe an Edinburgh firm, uh, you know, and, and some of the work they do that we're not locked that that British firms of which Scottish firms will be a big part of it aren't locked out of the market. So they're entirely consistent. Health as a whole shouldn't be off limits. Publicly funded health services. Yes, they are reserved. Okay, and, that, and we can see that. I mean, I know you're saying... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, and I appreciate you saying it time again. I really appreciate that. But where, where can we see that in terms of UK government policy written down statement? Well, it's, it's, as I said, CETA represents the state okay. of the art both in government policy. You know, they, we're, we're clear what we agree. And uh, the CETA agreement is very similar to where we would start with the, the US. And you're very welcome to see it in the CETA agreement. I mean, anywhere else you... But that's, that's what it represents, and that's the, uh, uh, the policy. And, uh, and the UK has been very active in the e European Council. We've got to remember, of course, it is a European decision, but we are very happy about that. If the health, you know, I, and, you know, I want to protect the health services as much as, as anyone. There's a, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that I think... You know, well, you mentioned earlier Park Heed. There's two reasons I'm a Park Heed. One is, of course... Um, the winners of the 1960 or the first uh, is, uh, British winners of the European Cup. The other one, however, is my dad was a GP in Parkhead, Deniston area for 40 years. You know, my sister is, uh, uh, is a psychiatrist. My wife does research on Alzheimer's. My four first cousins, include two of them, I think, are in the, in the Royal, are all doctors in the health service. Yeah, I was, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the health services, pardon me, my father to his dying days was really, I was a big disappointment to him. I wasn't a doctor. So, you know, we are protecting uh, 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 the, the health service. Now, the, it is true that the UK government today may have a different view of how some aspects of the health service are provided. That's true. But we certainly don't want uh, anything being put in an agreement that forces us to do things. That should be a matter of government policy. The Scottish government may have a different policy to, 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 to the English health service, to the Welsh health service, and, that's, and that should be fine. But last question. Ultimately, though, and ultimately, it's a matter for the United Kingdom government to determine 
whether it goes along those lines you're suggesting there or whether it may change its view, for example, after May. Ultimately, it's a UK well, government I can't, decision. I can't guarantee it changes its view I mean, uh, can, uh, can, after May. I, I can't even guarantee I'll be around <laughs> after May. You know, uh, if you, you know how to that's vote. Where, that, that's uh, where the power to decide this matter... I'm not even allowed matter. to vote, you know. Uh, but that, that's where the power to decide this matter would rest. No, but... It will rest with the British government to, if they are not happy with uh, the reservations relating to health, to say that. But the state of the art says X. And also, the EU Commission has been really, really clear about it. You know, it's sort of like, it's not even pushing it an open door. There's, there's complete agreement with the EU, and nobody's saying otherwise, including, by the way, the US. They don't... You know, they, you know, they've said publicly they're not seeking to have publicly funded services in the agreement. I mean, they don't want their police forces either to be, you know, open to uh, competition, etc. So it's, you know, it doesn't force the change in the way that the health service operates. And we have had gas for a very long time as well, which already has requirements. It doesn't take beyond that. Um, I can only keep on saying it. Okay. The okay. Is sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. Can we suspend it? Just resume at that point. I'd fi finished. My finished. Well, Willie. I've got Hansala and then Rod with a quick supplementary. Hansala. Uh, good morning, Lord Livingston and Mr. Barker. Uh, welcome to the Parliament. Uh, I see you're getting a bit of a hard time, and you might think it's unjust, justified. But I think I want, I want to raise two points here. First of all, uh, I'm a little concerned that there's not enough work done to try and determine the actual eventuality of how the jobs are going to be affected in Scotland, whether we're actually going to be winners, losers, or be a status quo. We, we have a very high rate of unemployment in Scotland, and we obviously want to protect our jobs and our industry, so uh, we, want to, we want to try and get some realistic figures of how that's going to impact on our employment uh, population. And, and secondary, in terms of the um, health service in, in, in Scotland, um, I think uh, people are a little nervous because it's perhaps not as clear in the uh, mandate that it could have been. And I think that's what's perhaps making people nervous. And I think uh, although you've, you've gone to great lengths to try and reassure the committee that that's not the fact, and the facts you've, you've, you've re repeated several times now, and. But I think we need, we need to ensure somehow that we get some sort of governmental commitment, not just about the European Union itself, but also the British government in office just now to say that this is not part of the plan at the moment, regardless of what happens after the election. I think we need to send out a very clear signal to people who, who feel um, very nervous and very uncomfortable with the status quo because the, the, there seems to be I'm not suggesting that it's your fault or anybody else's fault, but clearly there seems to be an apprehension in the community out there, and that needs to be showed up and reassured. What steps could you take to, to do that for us? I mean, you've, you've reassured us here at committee level, but I think, end of the day, the population out there is genuinely worried and, and, and fearful. What steps could you take to try and reassure them as well? I, mean, I agree with you that some people are getting fearful, largely because there are people who are going around saying uh, 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 the Tories are going to sell off uh, the health service to Americans. I mean, that's... And they're being told that repeatedly. And what we are saying, no, it is not true. And various government ministers, myself included, the uh, Secretary of State for Health has said the health service, the operation of the health services will not be affected by TTIP. They will continue, the decisions about how they are operated will continue to be that for the democratically elected government of the individual area. That's quite, quite clear and straightforward. And we will repeatedly say that that is the British government's policy. 
I think, as I said, the reason that uh, it wasn't a negotiating mandate, and you could look back to 2013 and say, oh, if we'd known now it would be such a big thing, should we have had it in the mandate? It was already in the GATS agreement, the, the, the reservation, so it wasn't a new thing. I mean, bear in mind, you can't have absolutely everything in the agenda, but it, it was, there was no disagreement, and there was some areas of you know, disagreement. Um, uh, uh, but if we can sort of part the mandate and say the mandate was what it was at the time, which was building on existing agreements, which were quite clear on the, on the issue, people have made it very clear. The UK government uh, has made it very clear in what it said repeatedly, and we are very supportive of the EU's position on this. There is no argument with the EU. I mean, I, I, I can't create an argument to say that we're, we're opposing them. I know people have tried to have, we're opposing the, this, but there is no disagreement. So the EU have been clear in it, we are clear in it, and I can only keep on saying that we will continue to, to uh, that from a UK government, as its government stands today, say that what is in CETA is, seems to us to be good. Uh, we do not wish, seek, or would agree with the uh, changes in the operation of the health service being caused as a result of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And in fact, one thing I can tell you that there's... Um, uh, another um, agreement, trade and service, has been negotiated, and I understand one country, not, not, the EU, not in the EU and not in the US, tried to put something in about it to do with health services, and we, and indeed the European Commission, pushed back extremely strongly and said, We're not even, it's not even on the table. And that remains the government's position. It's not what we want to see in it. And as I said, it's not what the Americans want to see in it. So hopefully I can keep on saying that. On the issue of, uh, of jobs... It is complex. I mean, one of the problems, to a degree, is that the, the economic modelling on this has been um, uh, probably the best economic modelling to date has been uh, done on, a, uh, on a, basically a full employment model in order to see what the impacts were on the economy rather, um, in terms of... And they assumed that the benefits came through higher wages rather than through um, necessarily net changes in employment because if you assume full employment, you, that would be the, the case. Um, I think as the agreement develops, we'll have to do more work um, on, on what's the, the pluses and minuses. Um, but what I would say is certainly we've done some work on uh, uh, some of the export industries, and I think uh, Scottish exports would, would benefit pretty much in line with the rest of the UK, looking at our export industries. Things like whisky would do well uh, and benefit from it, uh, but also some of our pharmaceutical industry would benefit. Um, but the exact impact on the jobs will depend ultimately also on how the companies react, how they go after exports, for example. You know, if, if we just sit in our hands and don't do anything about it, it will not be as advantageous as if we go after the marketplaces. And certainly speaking to a number of small companies, they do sit, and I do speak to a lot of small companies about it, the number of them that talk to me about the, they don't export to the US because it's just too difficult. Uh, you know, because they've got to the clothing manufacturers, and clothing's an area where I think we'll see benefits. And you know, um, quite often they have to uh, testing, fire destruction testing has to take place in Europe and in the US. So they destroy. If you're producing a million garments, it doesn't really matter. If you're producing high quality, as of course a lot of Scottish knitwear industry does, a couple, you know, a few hundred garments, it's rather expensive to do these sort of destructive testing. So I think it's, it's how the companies, and what, that's why I stressed that earlier, that we're really going to try and help uh, as you know, UKTI and, and SDI, I'm sure, as well, help the companies get after the opportunities and uh, make sure, actually, we get the best result. But, but generally, I think the question you have to ask yourself as well is, is free trade a good thing? You know, do you agree with the single market? Do you think um, you know, somebody said to me, free trade agreements are bad, if that's your belief set? <laughs> I don't agree with it, but it, it, we shouldn't be doing any free trade agreements. We shouldn't be part of the EU, and I know that wasn't what you were saying. Um, uh, on, but we do start from the position that free trade does actually aid the wealth of the economy. Partially, it's up to us then to make sure companies around the UK, including Scotland, go after these opportunities. And I think, given that we tend to be, have quite an open economy in the UK, it gives us a, a really good opportunity to go after it. Remember, the US is our biggest export market today. Yeah, but... Livingston, my, my question about uh, job losses is important because, as you'll appreciate, we have limited uh, opportunities of employment in Scotland as it is. 
And the reason why I'm asking about whether we're going to be winners or losers is to try and then build on that to say that if we are going to be on the losing end, how do we then support industry that's going to be losing end? Uh, and for example, you, you made a throwaway comment about we won't be able to export haggis, for example. Now, I eat vegetarian haggis. I don't see what's wrong with vegetarian haggis. It's full of vegetables. But, I mean, that's just an well, example. Well, sheep's lungs that they have a problem so, with, actually. So, so uh, I, yeah, so what I'm trying to get at is that I don't want to see any losses in jobs in Scotland. I want to know what you're doing to try and find out and how you're going to protect those jobs in Scotland for us and how you're going to support us to, to build on that. And when you, when you talk about, you know, people need to go out and find uh, business, that's fine. But I think uh, it's not fine if you're a small operator in a small part of the, of the UK and you're having to compete against the big giants. You need support for that. And I'm just wondering where that support would come from if that was required. Well, uh, one of the things with taking on any agreement is the length of time uh, that it, you, you put in to give people time to adapt. And that is not abnormal. It takes a long time for a number of these things to do. But a lot of the uh, changes, for example, are going to be about reduced tariffs uh, both ways, which are really good for prices as well. Um, and as the agreement develops, and at this point, we actually don't know all the areas that may be in or out, because there's some negotiation to do. We don't have an agreement, for instance, on services. Uh, uh, tariffs, and yet uh, services represent the majority of the UK economy, and so there's a lot of work to be done on exactly which are in and out. As we develop what's going to be in and out, what's going to be the regular adherence, the efforts we will make, as we did with Korea, to help the, the uh, to help create the winners and to help those other companies adjust, will be you know, very strong. You know, the reason we're doing this is to help the UK economy. That's the reason we're doing this. It's, it's not, there's no sudden ulterior motive. We do believe that free trade does help. Um, and, yes, uh, we provide things like export support. We'll work with SDI very closely. In fact, I'll, I'll see SDI uh, uh, later today. And as the agreement develops, and it'll take a number of years before it's implemented, uh, we, will, we will help the businesses and see what can be done to help them export and, to, and also to look at what the implications are for businesses that, for instance, might be against more imports and uh, um, because that the you know the farming industry or something like that that there will be you know American farmers are quite efficient or what can change or what specialization but it's it's too early to know this we are some distance off knowing and the implementation will take many years first things first uh, you know working on the Canadian one will probably be the next one thank you, thank you. Rod have you got a very brief supplementary Briefly, um, just on I ISDS, obviously not part of the current negotiating process. The Commission, after 150,000 uh, responses, public consultation, are kind of engaging with stakeholders. Can you just outline the UK government's current position on ISDS provisions? Current position is we believe the right ISDS clause should be in the agreement. We stress the word right ISDS clause. Um, ISDS is sometimes presented as being something new. Um, the UK has 97, I, no, sorry, 94 ISDS agreements, as well as, for instance, the Energy Charter Treaty, which effectively has ISDS clauses as well in it. Um, so we are, we've had ISDS for a long time. In fact, the 94 agreements we've got have been in existence, if you add it all up, for 2,000 years in aggregate. And do you know how many cases we've lost in that period? Sorry, you should, I, that's a rhetorical question. I wasn't asking a question. Uh, it, it's none. We've never lost a case in the UK. So... We believe ISDS is not something new, but we do believe it can be improved because actually there, A, there are some bad ISDS clauses around and B, we want to look at areas where we think it's being abused and misused and to tighten it up. And again, CETA went quite a long way along the line to do that. Now, what we're doing is looking at the responses to understand where people's concerns are and, and what further needs to be reflected. For instance, do we, you know, would it be good to have an, uh, an appeals mechanism um, uh, in it? But, but some of the stuff about also, you know, people say, talk about secret courts. Past ISDS, that was largely true. But the Americans and the Europe are both signed up, as we did in CETA, for it to be open, including NGOs can submit cases and things like that. So there's quite a lot of changes. So we believe, given that we are the biggest investor in the US and the US is the bigger investor in the UK, it is 
uh, it is helpful to have the right clause, but one that makes it entirely clear that the government's right to regulate is protected, but the same token that it's protection for discriminative action against uh, our companies in the US. Um, and, to, and to find that balance. So that's our position. And uh, yeah, bear in mind with 150,000, it has to be said, I think 97% or something plus of them were indeed uh, standard letters. Um, yeah, so we, but all of them will be reviewed in all the comments. But if the same comment appears on, on 80,000 occasions, it's difficult to separate it uh, uh, off. And um, so, no, we'll be working. And that's why they've suspended the discussion in ISDS to, to really take that on board. Um, as well as looking at CETA, and, um, you know, which I think, as I said, moved a long, long way away from, uh, from old ISDS clauses. Okay. I think we have to finish there, <laughs> because we do have another <laughs> item on the agenda that we have to deal with before we finish today, and we, our committees are not allowed to sit while the Chamber sits, and it will be sitting in nine minutes, so um, <laughs> very, very quick. Um, can I, can I thank you very much, for, for Lord Livingston, for coming along to the committee. As you can see, it, it has been a matter of great consternation, not within this committee, but um, as you realised um, uh, with the, the, the public um, gallery, there has been a lot of very, very keen interest in this, a lot of fear, um, possibly a lot of misunderstanding, but maybe some very, very clear statements from the UK government would address some of that and maybe allay some of those fears. So I hope that we have learned a lot from you this morning and we hope that you have learned a lot from us this morning as Thank well. You. Thank Hopefully you. you've heard some very, very clear statements. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on very, very quickly to our last agenda item, which is um, to seek agreement from the committee to take the... to take the... Um, the committee's draft report on TTIP in private to allow us to, to do with that. Agreed? Okay. And on the EU engagement strategy. Yes, and the one on the EU engagement strategy as well. Sorry, it's, it's both both things. If we can have that agreement, that's very helpful. Um, and I now close this meeting and thank you very much for your patience and your participation this morning.